All right. So now that it looks like we're up and running, there is a little business to attend to because I think twice in the last month, um, Pastor Ray has mentioned something about me not having any hair on my ankles. And, you know, rumors fly. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, maybe it's been a long time since Pastor Ray has looked at my ankles. Because, you know, so, so yesterday I'm putting on my socks and, and Julie takes a picture of me. And, and you know, I mean, there, there's clearly some hair there. So, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, all right? So anyway... Um, just just wanted to clarify here before we go on. So in any case, um, Home on the Range. I think you're all familiar with this song. Uh, in fact, it's the state song of Kansas. I looked it up in good old Wikipedia, and it says it became the state song in 1947. And this may be a funny place to begin the sermon, but... Um, you know, we know the words, Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. But here's the line that I want to focus on today. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the sky is not cloudy all day. You know, um, it maybe it used to be that way, but I'm not sure in Kansas or anywhere in the United States or in the world Seldom has heard a discouraging word. I think we're kind of surrounded by discouraging words constantly in our society, in social media, on television, on the radio. There's so much discouragement going around these days. And it seems to me that Kansas and our church and the world are ready for some good news, an encouraging word, the hope of Jesus in particular, we're going to look at an example of someone in the Bible whose life exhibited encouragement, not discouragement, so much so that he became known by his nickname, Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. And I hope that we can learn from his example to become spirit-filled encouragers to a discouraged world. You might be surprised to hear that Barnabas, maybe as common as his name is, at least in in Christian circles, he's mentioned 28 times in the book of Acts alone, and five more times in Paul's other writings. And in the book of Acts, he is the third most frequently mentioned follower of Jesus, after Paul, Peter, and then Barnabas. So let's look today at the life of Barnabas and find out a little bit about who he was, why he was so encouraging, and how we can learn from his example to be spirit-filled encouragers to those around us. So who was Barnabas? Well, first of all, if you have your Bibles or if you look on your bulletin inserts, the first time we see Barnabas mentioned is in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. And there's quite a bit of information listed here in this particular verse. Starts off, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So there are several things here just to begin with as we refresh our memories of who this man was. So certainly, he was an early follower of Jesus. And I think I'm not making progress here on the PowerPoint. There we go. So what are some things we learned from this passage in chapter 4? Well, first of all, on the personal side, we know that his actual name was Joseph, which... Uh, is kind of interesting. There's more than one Joseph in the Bible, namely Jesus' earthly father, but his given name by his parents was Joseph. And because his name was Joseph, at least one of his parents probably, um, or possibly both, but 
uh, could be that uh, because, and I say at least one of his parents was Jewish, is because he was, it says, of the tribe of Levi. He was a Levite, so probably coming down from his father's side. And we also know, however, that he was from Cyprus. So he was not originally from Israel. He was from the Greek island of Cyprus. So he was a Greek speaker. But if he was Jewish, he was also a Hebrew speaker, Aramaic speaker, bilingual, which would have been very beneficial in the early days of spreading the gospel. So he and uh, Paul, as they teamed up later on, were able to spread the gospel both to Greek speakers in the Roman Empire as well as Hebrew speakers in Palestine. And with his knowledge of Greek, he would have been not only a valuable asset in preaching the word, but also in sharing the gospel and possibly even helping Paul, maybe taking dictation for some of the letters that Paul wrote to the churches in the New Testament. We also find out from this passage that he had a nickname, and that's the nickname that we know him by. Because if you mention the name Joseph, you know, uh, Paul's companion Joseph, nobody would know who you're talking about. But his name was a nickname, Barnabas. And we'll get into a little bit of where that name comes from exactly here in a moment. But it's a Hebrew word meaning son of encouragement. So we've got the Greek word there, Barnabas, and it comes from a Hebrew word, bar, is the Hebrew word for son, and then naba is the Hebrew word translated encouragement. It also means in Hebrew, uh, in English translation, prophecy. And that will come into play a little bit later as we look into what it means to be an encourager. So he was a son of encouragement, a son of prophecy. He was prophetic, and that's a powerful combination in the life of a disciple of Jesus. Well, finally, we also find that he was generous and apparently had some wealth because if you go back to Acts chapter 4, verse 36, actually verse 37, it says that he sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So he was a person of at least some means, but he was also generous. And we know from Scripture that God loves a generous giver and he sold that property, gave it all to the Lord, laid it at the apostles' feet for them to do however they felt best for the advancement of the gospel. So there are a few personal things that we know about Barnabas. What else do we know about him, say, vocationally? Well, one thing is that he was bivocational. It's possible that he was a tent maker. We know that Paul was a tent maker, and because they teamed up, it would not be surprising that Paul showed him the business of how to make tents and uh, helped make a living for themselves. Not only did the churches donate to their ministry, but they were also uh, working on their own and, and the money that they earned from that income supplied their physical needs as well as also the advancement of the gospel. How do we know that they were bivocational? Well, again, we know that Paul was, but there's a verse in 1 Corinthians Uh, that mentions particularly where Paul writes, or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right not to work for a living? Now, this is a little bit of backwards the way it's written, but what he is saying is that Barnabas and I do work for a living. We do have a trade that we work at to supply our own physical needs. So we're not totally dependent upon um, the gifts that might come in from from, uh, their their disciples and and some of the churches. Well, what else do we know, not only about Paul and Barnabas personally, but what do we know about Barnabas spiritually? And here's where we get into more of the meat about what I want us to understand today about what it means to be a spiritual encourager. First of all, the scripture says that Barnabas was a spiritual leader. Namely, if we look at Acts chapter 11, verse 24, we see that he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and in my own words, he was an evangelist. Why do I say that? Acts eleven twenty-four, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, 
and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And here we're speaking specifically about Barnabas, not necessarily Barnabas and Paul together. What I found was interesting, and I just did a, a, a little bit of study in preparation for the message of this term, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And when I did my research, I came up with three people in the Bible who are called full of the Holy Spirit and faith with those exact words. Isn't it interesting? The first person who's mentioned to be full of the Holy Spirit and faith is Jesus. The second person who is full of the Holy Spirit and faith was Stephen. And Pastor Ray preached on Stephen last week. And the third person mentioned as being full of the Holy Spirit and faith is Barnabas. By the way, three weeks ago, I actually started preparing for today's sermon, and I was all set to preach on Stephen. And Pastor Ray stole my thunder last week, <laughs> which is great because it was, a, uh, it was a message we needed to hear from the Lord, but it also just confirmed to me that that's what we were supposed to hear. God was impressing on both of our hearts the importance of Stephen and his life and what we can learn from that man who was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And now this week, the Lord led me to talk now about the second man after Jesus that was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. But also, we find out from this passage that many people were brought to the Lord. He was an evangelist, and there is nothing more encouraging than the good news of Jesus. That's what an evangelist does. Share the good news. And yet, when you hear about the good news, or when you use this word evangelist, evangelism, evangelical, what kind of a reputation do we have in the world today? I googled a little bit to find out what people in the world think when they hear today in 2021 evangelical. Here are some of the responses that came up in a Google search. White Christian Republican, Religious right, narrow-minded, homophobic, misogynistic, and racist. That's what the world thinks we are. It's not good. In fact, it's wrong. It's false. And as I was reading these words on Google, this verse came to mind. The words of Jesus, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. These are not, the term evangelical is not a dirty word. It's not a political word. It means we are a people of the good news. And I think even well, I wish the world would understand who we are, but I think sometimes even in the church, we don't understand what it means to be evangelical, to be a people of the good news. Now, again, because I, I, I love going back and finding the roots of words and how they're important to us today, I just want us to see something. The word evangelical comes from this particular Greek word, euangelion. And if you divide it up, you can kind of see that EU, or sometimes it's transliterated EV, E-V-A-N-G-E-L, begins to look like evangelical, right? If you separate those parts of the original language out, EU means good in Greek, and angel, we recognize that word, angel. What's an angel? An angel is a messenger in the Bible. So the evangel, your evangelion, 
was literally a good message or good news. That's all it meant in, in the original language. And when it got translated into Old English, it came into our language literally as goad, which is Old English for good, and spell, which meant news in Old English. And when Tyndale translated the Bible into English, he took that Old English word, goad spell, good news, and it became the English word gospel. That was an interesting history, right? Over the course of several hundred, even thousands of years, but you take this Greek word that gets literally translated as good news, and then it comes down into modern English as gospel. And when you tell the average person today about the gospel, they have no clue whatsoever that you're talking about the good news, do they? The gospel is some religious word. And the gospel only means the good news of Jesus. Take it a step further. Now, when you say, talk about someone being an evangelist or evangelism or I'm an evangelical, people, it doesn't mean homophobic. It means I'm a person of the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's get it straight and let's preach it and let's say it to the world that we are a people of good news. You know, if I don't want to give up those good words, right? But in a world that has no clue who we are or what we stand for or have false ideas of who we are, let's make it loud and clear. We believe in the good news, and you can't mess that up. Well, not only was Barnabas a person, a preacher of the good news, and many people came to faith because of his sharing of the good news. He was also an apostle and a missionary. Acts 14, 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, right? And it goes on to explain. But my point here is they were both, Barnabas and Paul, not Paul only, but Barnabas was also an apostle. Now look at the scripture from Acts 11.22, and I'm going to explain why I'm putting both of these together. This news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent, and there's a Greek word there, apostello, Barnabas, to Antioch. Now, we're going to switch over, and I'm going to do one more Greek lesson. I'm not going to bore you with lots and lots of Greek today, but... but it gets me excited, and I think there's a point here that you can see. There's a verb in Greek, and in, in the verse that I just read, in Acts 11.22, it says, they sent Barnabas. They're using this Greek word, apostello. And see what I underlined there? Apostol, right? It sounds like our English word, apostle. That's where it comes from in Greek, literally. If you look at the noun form on the right side of the screen, someone who is sent is an apostolos, apostle, but there's a noun form and a verb form. Now, the apo part means away. The stel or the stole part of apostol means someone who is sent. So, but it's not just simply, there are lots of Greek words to send. But apostle is someone who sent away with a commission. You've got a purpose. You have been chosen and you have been sent out with authority with a message of good news. So the apostle, and as it keeps coming down into English, it gets a little bit watered down. Right? When you hear the word sent, they sent Barnabas to Antioch, you don't think, oh, he was sent as an apostle with a commission to encourage the believers there. Right? You just say, oh, they, they sent him off. They, they shipped him out. That's not what it means. Or look on the other side when it says he's an apostle. 
Now, when we hear the apostle, word apostle today, let alone in the world, right? I mean, the world, when they hear the word apostle, they have no clue what that word means, right? But I think even in the church, the word apostle is misunderstood, right? And, and there are some traditions or some denominations that might, you know, um, Pastor Secor, when he greets me on Sundays, will often call me Brother Dan, right? If we were in this, some other denomination, he might call me Apostle Dan, right? It sounds a little bit weird to our ears because we've kind of reserved this apostle almost like the word saint. And I think we've, we've learned enough that we know that the word saint is not just reserved for a few special people that happen to appear in the Bible, Right? All God's holy ones, all those who are believers, are saints in Jesus Christ. And the word apostle has been kind of relegated. And, and there is, there is a, a scriptural reason why that the word apostle has to do with the spiritual gifting. But it's also something that all of us can do. Because you've heard about the Great Commission, We're talking about being sent with a commission. All of us are bound under the Great Commission. Jesus has sent all of us out with a commission. And in that sense, we all are apostles sent out with a commission to share the good news with those around us. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But... When I used the term missionary, and I was a little bit, should I put the word missionary? Because if I go back to the scripture, right, it says that the apostles, Barnabas and and Paul. It doesn't say the word missionaries, Barnabas and Paul. Do you know know how many times the word missionary is used in the Bible? (laughs) Zero. I was like, wait. We're, we belong to the missionary church, right? Uh, there's got to be the word missionary there somewhere. Um, now, don't fret, okay? It's not like we're heretics or something. Um, the guy, Trinity's not in the Bible either, okay? But we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But apostle, right? Those who are sent out with a commission, those are missionaries. And you don't have to be a, a missionary to Timbuktu. You can be an apostle. You can be a missionary to your neighbor next door, to the person at work, or wherever God calls you, you are sent with a commission. So let's not give up that word um, too easily. It's a precious word. It's a deep word. And God calls all of us to be responsive to that commission. Now, if we go on to the next point, Barnabas was also a prophet and a teacher. We see in Acts 13.1. Now, the church in Antioch, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, namely Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul who eventually becomes known as Paul. So a prophet. Now, I'm not going to go into the Greek in this one, which I could, because this is an interesting Greek word as well. But we're talking here not only about the prophet, the one with the spiritual gift who can foretell events that are going to happen in the future, but we're also talking about the prophet who can speak forth boldly the truth of the good news. Every church needs prophets and teachers who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who know the Word of God, and can teach it effectively to others. We are gifted. We are blessed in this church to have those among us who have those gifts, gifts of apostleship, of leadership, gifts of of prophecy, gifts of evangelism, gifts of teaching, And that's what a healthy body needs is all of those leadership giftings working together to edify the body, to build the body up so that we in turn can be the ones sent out to share that good news of Jesus. Well, next, and this really gets at the heart of today's message, is that he was an encourager to Gentile believers. In Acts 11, verses 22 to 23, 
News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent, which remember, they sent him with a commission, Barnabas, to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. They sent. Now, Again, it's, it's really kind of interesting at multiple levels in the language because remember, Barnabas. What does Barnabas' nickname mean in, in Hebrew? Son of encouragement. They sent the son of encouragement to encourage the believers in Antioch. Right? You hear the play on words that doesn't come across at all whatsoever in English? They sent the son of encouragement to encourage the people. He was the right man for the job. There were people who were discouraged in Antioch. They were under severe persecution. There were false preachers spreading throughout, telling the people, no, what Paul said, you you got it wrong, you need to do this and this and this. And, And they sent him to encourage and to exhort and to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ and to remind them of the good news that they had heard. Barnabas was the right man for the right time, knew exactly what they needed, and they sent him to be that encourager. But I also want to add, and this is a little bit indirect, but I also want to add that he was humble. When you read these two verses, it's pretty subtle. But in Acts chapter 12, verse 25, it says, When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Three chapters later, but Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. When I say he was humble there was a time when Barnabas had to go from number one to number two. Do you see that even subtly in the word order? Originally, Barnabas was the Christian first. Barnabas was the spiritual mentor to Saul, who became Paul. Barnabas was the spiritual leader as Saul was becoming the man that God wanted him to be, whom we now call Paul. And as you read through Acts chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, all of a sudden the tables turn. And it's God's will, but Paul becomes the spiritual leader. Paul becomes the number one figure and Barnabas becomes the follower. It was a team, but Barnabas becomes number two. Remember who came first, Jesus or John the Baptist? They're pretty close in age, but who started preaching first? John the Baptist. And there came a point, right? John the Baptist had disciples. He was baptizing. People were coming to the Lord, and people were following him and his message. And there came a time when John made this statement, talking about Jesus, he must increase, and I must decrease. That takes humility on the part of someone to say, don't follow me. You know, if it, there probably was something human in John the Baptist that said, it's, it's pretty cool that these guys are following me. But eventually, John had to say, no, I'm not the one you need to follow. It's Jesus. And he humbled himself so that Jesus could shine. Well, finally, Barnabas was a spiritual mentor, not only to Paul, but I'm going to put it in this category. He was a spiritual mentor to two writers of the New Testament. 
Of course, to Paul, Barnabas taught Paul. Barnabas was the discipler originally, and he mentored Paul. Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Barnabas was also a spiritual mentor to John Mark, whom we call Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark. One Gospel, 13 books, that's 14 books of the New Testament. There are 27 books total in the New Testament. Barnabas was the spiritual mentor of two men who wrote half of the New Testament. His impact, even though in every, you know, before today's sermon, yeah, maybe we've heard of Barnabas, and maybe we, we, but we didn't know a lot about him except he was a companion of Paul. What kind of a legacy did Barnabas leave us because of his faithfulness by mentoring, investing his life in a guy named Saul who most of the Christians were deathly afraid of because of his past, and he stuck his neck out and said, I see something in him. I see what God's doing in his life. And the same thing, we'll talk here in a moment about Mark. But he stuck his neck out for a young man named John Mark who said, yeah, even though he's messed up in the past, I, I see something in him. And that gift of encouragement kicked in to the point where Mark became fully the man of God that God intended him to be. Don't you want to have that kind of legacy in your life? Maybe it's not going to be you that, that's the Billy Graham, but maybe, maybe that person that you mentor is going to be the evangelist. Maybe that person you mentor is going to be an apostle, a missionary, someone who's sent out. Or maybe just simply that legacy. I was reading this past week about the legacy of John, the disciple John, and he had a disciple that most of us have never heard of because he has a funky name, Polycarp, and he sounds like a fish. But, right, he, he had a disciple. Jesus had a disciple named John, but John didn't just stop. It's like, oh, I'm so glad I'm making it to heaven. He invested his life in other people, one of whom is Polycarp. And Polycarp didn't stop there either. We see this chain through through early church history, through the first century and in the second century and beyond, Polycarp has a disciple, Irenaeus. And Irenaeus is writing to the churches, the same churches, right? We have letters written to, to, to the church in Philippi by these guys saying, keep on doing it, keep on doing it. And there's the spiritual legacy being passed down from one person to the next over the years. And that spiritual legacy kept on being passed down to people who encouraged others in the faith, right? Those, those saints, that cloud of witnesses that is cheering people on and encouraging them, saying, go, 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 you'll make it to the end. And that comes down all the way to the year 2022, and here you are, the next in line to be the encouragers and the witnesses and the apostles and the missionaries to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So what this all gets down to, as far as application is, Barnabas is also an encouraging example for us. The word encouragement, the Greek word for encouragement is a really fascinating word that I love, and some of you have heard me talk about this before. One Greek word gets all these definitions in a Bible dictionary, right? It's amazing. Now, I underline the top one because that's the one that gets closest to the literal meaning. So a calling near or a summons, especially for help. It is encouraging, right? When you, when you need help, and someone, you can call someone and they come to your aid. That's an encouragement. But the Greek word also means exhortation. Ooh, yeah, it feels a little bit, you know, looks like you're messing in my business. But it is encouraging when someone has enough care for you 
that they'll set you straight and exhort you when you need to hear the truth. Consolation, comfort, persuasive speaking, instruction, admonition, powerful discourse. What a conglomeration of words in comes from one single Greek word that a lot of times we say means encouragement. Well, let me go here. Last Greek lesson for the day, I promise. So the Greek word that all of those meanings come from is paraklesis in Greek. Para, as you see there, alongside. This is para in Greek. Clay means called, right? As in, you've heard this term, ek, ek, clay, sia, right? Called out, the church is called out. Well, this is called alongside. So, how is encouragement called alongside? Well, if you're called alongside, it's someone who can give you exactly what you need at that moment. And maybe that's encouragement. Maybe that's comfort to help you. Maybe it's exhortation to instruct you. But all of those things are someone who can, you can call alongside at that moment of need. And I'm going to switch this because you're going to see another Greek word that looks like paraklesis, and that's parakletos. It just has a different ending. So encouragement, paraklesis, Someone who knows how to do that or is spiritually gifted to do that is a parakletos. And that is the word that John uses to describe the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter, but also he's the advocate. Now, how do we get the word advocate out of there? Well, the word parak, the Greek word parakletos took on, actually in Greek society, it was a legal term. It was your lawyer, was your parakletos. Your lawyer was your encourager. Why? Because it can be a little intimidating to stand before the judge, but your advocate is someone that you call to be right alongside you in the courtroom. And he will speak on your behalf. He will be right there to comfort you, to help you, to encourage you, to hold your hand. Whatever you need at that moment, the parakletos can help you. And that's what I think is so beautiful about this term, encouragement. Because it's not just simply encouragement, and that in itself is a powerful thing. But it is comfort. It is help. It is exhortation. It is admonition. It is persuasive speaking because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what you need at that moment. And he is able to, to fulfill every need that your heart, your mind, your soul needs. And I'm getting excited. All right. Well, where does this take us? Well, first of all, yes, encouraging is a spiritual gift. In Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in according with your, accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. You know, I have never heard of the spiritual gift of discouragement. But I've seen discouragement in operation in people. Unfortunately, I've seen it from time to time, even in the church. 
you may well know people who are pretty good at finding fault and discouraging other people. Watch out. Don't let Satan get that foothold in your life. I understand it is easy to become negative when life circumstances are difficult. It is easy to become discouraged when we see what is happening around us in our world. But friends, take heart. We are a people of hope. We are a people of good news. And it, it's sad to see people who were once very positive, encouraging people become negative and discouragers as they get older. And I'm not getting down on old people because I'm getting there. <laughs> but you know the kind of person that looks like they are been baptized in vinegar. You have permission to hold me to this. I do not want to become a cranky old man. <laughs> okay? I've said that. Hold me to it. However many years the Lord gives me, if you see me getting cranky, show, them a, show me a video of this and said, you did not want to become cranky. Now, why do people become cranky when they get, you know, again, life circumstances, hurt people, hurt people, physical ailments, it's, it, it can be challenging to be chipper when you feel terrible. I understand all those things. But I also know plenty of godly people who age gracefully. And I want to age gracefully. I want to I age as an encourager. I want to age as a man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. I want to be like the disciples who were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, as we see here, yes, encouragement, encouraging is a spiritual gift. And some people are gifted by the Holy Spirit, especially to be encouragers. But that does not get us off the hook, right? The rest of us. You can all be an encourager to some extent. And so when you're tempted to become old and cranky, it is not your excuse to say, that's just not my spiritual gift, all right? Um, you can do it. And I will try my best to encourage you to be an encourager. And we have many encouragers in our church. Look around. I've, we have some beautiful people and beautiful encouragers here. They know just the right thing to say at the right time. We need them. They're a valuable part of our morale. They're a, beautiful, a valuable part of our church community, our body. But it is something that every single one of us can do. At the same time, and I'm, I am certain that Barnabas had the gift of, of encouragement. But, you know, I wonder if Barnabas' strong gifting, sometimes when we teach on spiritual gifts, we'll say, that those people that have a certain gifting also can present some challenges. I wonder if Barnabas's strong gifting as an encourager led to a challenging time in his life. And what I mean is this passage from Acts chapter 15. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus back to his homeland. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. You see, young Mark had started out in the Lord, started out with Paul and Barnabas together in their mission work. And the scripture does not clarify to us exactly what happened, except to say that Mark at some point deserted Paul and Barnabas in Pamphylia. But God wasn't through with Mark yet. 
He wanted Mark on the team. Mark was going to be an evangelist. Mark was going to be one of the writers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I suspect that Barnabas discerned that, that even though this kid was young, even though he messed up, that gift of encouragement says, God's not done with him yet, and, and, and I, can, I can mentor him. And his gifting to encourage Mark in his God-ordained place of ministry actually led him to part ways with Paul, his brother. Now, if this were the end of the story, there'd be an element of that would feel kind of sad. You know, what happened? I, I, I don't like stories that end with people parting ways and over a sharp disagreement. I don't like conflict, and I'm sure it was hard at the time for, for Paul and Barnabas. But whatever happened in that temporary split, it was for the advancement of God's kingdom, and clearly it was not a permanent division. There was healing, and Paul eventually saw the truth that Barnabas saw in young Mark. I've always been so thankful that God inspired Paul to write these words near the end of his life. From prison, Paul wrote, Only Luke is with me. But you know, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Yeah. They were a team. Now, Barnabas isn't mentioned here, but in the background, I just have the suspicion that Paul and Barnabas, were they were brothers. Yep, it was only a a temporary parting. And Barnabas mentored Mark to become the young man that God wanted him to be. And Paul eventually realized that and brought him back on the team. And in fact, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, in Paul's final days, he says that Mark was with Paul. He came and was with him when his life came to an end. Now, some of us today, like Barnabas, have been given the special gift of encouragement. Use it. Use it in the church. But whether or not you've got the gift, encouragement is something that you can all do to some degree. And in fact, we are commanded to do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore, encourage one another. Not those of you who have the gift of encouragement encourage one another, but all of you encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. You know, I talked about leaving a legacy. I was thinking of my own spiritual legacy this week. And there's a man, when we were on vacation, uh, we went up to see uh, my last living aunt who lives in Minnesota, and uh, my, my family has roots in a particular town there called Painesville, Minnesota. And in that particular town lived a man by the name of Frank Pratt. And I have a table that Frank Pratt made. He was a beautiful, he was an amazing woodworker and did inlaid wood. And I have a table by Frank Pratt. And the reason I have a table by Frank Pratt is because Frank Pratt is the man who led my grandfather to the Lord. And my grandfather became a preacher. And he passed his faith on to my mother, who passed her faith on to a man who eventually was to become her husband. And together they passed their faith on to a boy named Daniel, me, and I want to pass that legacy on to my son, Micah. Amen. And I want that legacy to continue on, a legacy of encouragement. In fact, the story goes, and, and this goes back before my time, but my grandfather was a tall, large man. And Frank Pratt was this... I, I, I did meet Frank Pratt, but he was literally about that tall. He was a little short guy, 
but powerful in the Lord. And the story goes that after my grandfather got saved, he would sit in a chair and Frank Pratt would come and sit on his knee and disciple my grandfather, which is quite an image. And he was an encourager, right? My grandfather, I mean, it's not that he knew nothing about the Lord. He, he grew up in the church, but he wasn't saved. But he, he came to know the Lord, and this man spent hours and hours and hours with him, encouraging him in the Lord, and being a spiritual mentor. And I think we can all be that spiritual mentor to people Think about the encouragers in your life. I know you have some. Julie's an encourager to me daily. Pastor Ray over the years has been an encourager to me. Um, I remember uh, there, there was a, one of my professors in graduate school was, was a nun. And one day um, I was by myself in my office and contemplating if, if I was going to just drop out of grad school because I was discouraged about a, a teacher, a class that I had, and that's a long story, but this teacher wanted me to write something that, that I took issue with, and I thought, if this is grad school, I don't even want to be here. And this professor, who's a nun, she, she walks in and, and looks in my office and says, Are you okay? I said, well, kind of thinking I'm in the wrong place. And she sat down and encouraged me. And it, it altered literally the course of my life. And, and she helped me and encouraged me, and I stayed in grad school. Um, God's Word, the Holy Spirit, of course, uses His Word to encourage us daily, so much so that uh, I don't know how people... Uh, live without the word of God, without his, his constant encouragement speaking to them on a daily basis. But I know all of you have encouragers in your life. My challenge to you today, though, is to do the same. Would you be the encourager to someone? Now, you'll notice that my emphasis today has been on you being the encourager I know good and well that there are some people here today who also are in need of encouragement. If that's you, you know, in my case, I gave the illustration of, of, this, of my professor who saw that I was down, and she reached out to me. But if you're down, and maybe, maybe you're pretty good at putting a mask on and we shake your hand at church and say, how are things going? He's oh, fine. And go find your seat and you leave. And things aren't fine. Would you, would you take a step? If you look around here, there's a whole bunch of people who would love to encourage you today if you're hurting. There's a song, Are You Hurting and Broken Within? Oh, Come to the Altar. There are people who want to encourage you. God wants to encourage you. His word wants to encourage you. The Holy Spirit, who is the encourager, wants to encourage you. But let us know how we can help you. This morning in our prayer time, um, as Cheryl was praying, she mentioned a scripture from Jeremiah. It talks about where Jeremiah the prophet says, you know, is... Jerusalem is destroyed. There's nothing left. Total discouragement. Is, is, is there a balm in Gilead? Is, is there something? Is there anything that can bring healing in this kind of disaster? Which brought to mind a beautiful old song that goes, There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the 
sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to the sin sick soul. Well, in conclusion, you see in your handout in the bulletin insert that I've given some scriptures that we're not going to take time to go through today, but I guess as a teacher, I've got permission to give you homework. And I would encourage you, yeah, very encourage. I encourage you, take these home. Make it part of your devotion. Let the word encourage you this week as you go through these scriptures and ask yourself a variety of questions. You know, um, who or what is doing the encouraging in this particular verse? For what purpose is encouragement being offered? Who is the recipient of the encouragement and what are they encouraged to do? How can I put this into action? What do you then learn from the variety of encouragers that you see listed here? And what might your responsibility be to encourage others? After all, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So here's my final challenge for the week. As I mentioned, Barnabas, son of encouragement. So it may be easy for you guys, right? Guys, I want you to be men. I want you to be men. I want you to be sons of encouragement. But as I thought about this, I thought, well, come on. We need to do something to encourage the ladies here, all right? Because maybe you don't feel like sons of encouragement. Remember, bar in Hebrew means son. The word for daughter in Hebrew is bat. All right? So women, uh, you can be a batnabus. All right? <laughs> Men, you be a Barnabas. Women, you're not batty, but you're going to be a bat. You're going to be a batnabus. Okay? Not a bat in a bus. You're, you're, you're going to be a batnabus. And you're going to be a daughter of encouragement as you go forth from this place. So who needs your encouragement this week? I encourage you. I encourage you to pray and ask God to reveal someone to your heart and mind and then determine how you can be a spiritual encourager to him or her. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the message of your word. It is good news, good news that the world needs to hear, and we can be bearers of that good news through our encouraging words and through our encouraging example. Lord, help us to be sons and daughters of encouragement in a world that desperately needs you, in a world that is so confused and so discouraged. Where can we go? Lord, you have the words of hope and life. Lord, we run to you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is someone that we call alongside. You are right next to us, encouraging us moment by moment. Lord, may we be that person to someone else that you lead us to. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.